please turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. We'll start there. 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5. And it says there, For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So the title of my sermon this morning is The Man Christ Jesus. Now when it comes to studying the life of Jesus, you can study like his doctrine, you can study uh, how he preached, you can study the miracles that he did, you can also look at how he fulfilled Old Testament prophecies. A lot of things you can study about the life of Jesus, but today what I want to look at is what type of man was Jesus? Like what type of person was he? Because I don't know about you guys, but I often think about what would have been like to meet Jesus as a person? Like, what would it have been like to bump into him in a coffee shop, like next, next to you and have a chat to him? Like, what would he have been like as a person? And these are the things I like to ponder and think about. So the sermon today is going to be looking at Jesus as a person. Like, what personality was he like? What would he have been like to me? And the reason I want to do this is because with Jesus, what we see is a perfect man without sin. Yet at the same time, he was a man, a person just like you and I. He was totally relatable as a person. And we see with Jesus, he had a, a personality which is totally uncorrupted by sin, like a perfect man in every single way. And I want to look at six things in particular about his life, about his, about his personality, and to see how we compare and we should try and be like him. Because the more you like, are like Jesus, the better ambassador of, of Jesus you'll be. Because he was like the perfect soul and he was so good with people that he could discern people so well that he knew how to relate to that person to give them the word of God. And that's what I'm talking about today. We want to look at Jesus as a person and then try and be like him. But as a man, he, was, he had the Holy Spirit without measure. So we're no, never going to reach Jesus' level of perfection, but we can keep aiming while we're in this body, while we're in this life, to keep aiming to be more like him. Okay, so... First of all, I want to start by way of introduction, by looking at that Jesus, even though he was a normal man like you and I, yet he was also God at the same time. So you're there in 1 Timothy. If you can just turn over now to chapter 3 and verse 16. So we've seen already in chapter 2 that he was a man. Christ Jesus was a man. And 1 Timothy chapter 3 verse 16 says there, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. So we can see that Jesus was also God, yet at the same time, he was a man. And he had to become a normal man in order to take on the sins of the whole world, of all mankind, to die on, on behalf of all mankind. If he wasn't a normal man, then he wouldn't have been qualified to take on the sins of of mankind. So even though he was God, he also became a normal man. And as well as becoming a man to take on our sins, he also became a normal man to give us an example of the, what we should follow. And that's what we're going to be looking at today in a bit more detail. So turn to Philippians chapter 2 and verse 6. And we're going to look at now how he was God, but then becoming a man, humbling himself to become a normal man of no reputation. Philippians 2 verse 6 says there, Who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So that's a bit of an unusual phrase there, but let's have a look at that for a second. So when you commit robbery, what you're doing is you're taking something that doesn't belong to you. So Jesus did not think it was robbery to be equal with God, meaning he was equal with God, like he was God. And that wasn't a thing that he was apologetic for. That wasn't a thing that he shied away from. Let's keep reading verse 7. But even though he was God and happy to be God and didn't uh, shy away from that, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. So we can see that Jesus, even though he is God, he chose not to have a reputation. He chose to humble himself and be a normal man and be an example unto us how we should live and please God. So he chose to live as a normal man, living in obedience to the Father at all times. And he's given us that example that we should follow. So let's look at the, uh, the six things I want to study in the life of Jesus and uh, see how we measure up with those things and keep aiming towards to, to be more like him uh, as a person. 
So the first one is, if you, you're all in, in Philippians chapter 2, just go back to verse 3. And the first point is about Jesus' character or his personality was that he was a person that esteemed others better than himself. And that can be a bit uncomfortable to hear that because we know that he's God. But at the same time, he esteemed others better than himself. Have a look there at verse 3 of Philippians chapter 2 and I'll show you what I mean. Let nothing be done through, vain, through strife or vain glory, but in lowliness of mind that each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Verse 5, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. So Jesus had the mindset that I'm not going to be just thinking about my things, but I'm going to be thinking about the things of others. And he actually esteemed others better than himself in his normal interactions with everyday people. He wasn't trying to make himself be dominant in conversations and putting himself out there. So look, don't you know who I am? But he humbled himself and actually esteemed others better than himself. And he's God in the flesh and he's given us example. We also ought to not be mindful of our own things all the time, but what's going on in other people's lives. Yet, at the same time, he did not think it robbery to be equal with God. So we just read in um, John chapter 4 that the woman at the well said to Jesus, are you greater than our, our, our father Jacob who, who gave us this well? And Jesus didn't go, oh no, there's no false humility. Even though he humbled himself, it wasn't a false humility. He didn't go, oh no, Abe, Jacob's so great, I'm not trying to say, like he didn't say that. He just let her speak and didn't correct her because he knew he was greater than, than Jacob. And also Jesus said, a greater than Solomon is here. And he said, before Abraham was, I am. So he's not shying away. But at the same time, he's given us a, an example that we do still need to esteem others better than himself. And of course, he also said, I am the son of God. Okay. So we need to be like Jesus and not make people feel like inferior to us. Like if you hadn't met Jesus in his day, you would have felt totally comfortable to be with him. He would have been an easy person to be around because he would have made you feel valuable. He would have been interested in your life. He wouldn't have been just talking about his own things. He would have been interested in you and you would have been totally relaxed and comfortable with him. I think that's why, you know, in the garden they had to say, well, the one that we are going um, kiss, he's the one because he's a normal everyday guy. He didn't stand out as being a dominant person in the group. He wasn't the most maybe outgoing you know, person always talking, always, you know, being the centre of activity or attention. Even as a child, Jesus was like this. So you children, if anyone here 12 years old? Any 12-year-olds? Yes, Nicholas. Even Jesus was like this as a 12-year-old and he had a great favour with adults. Like adults like Jesus. Have a look there in Luke chapter 2. Even as, in, in Luke chapter 2, when he was left in Jerusalem and they, they lost him for a few days, at this point in his life, he knew he was the son of God because he said, I've, I've been about my father's business. So he knew who he was, but at the same time, have a look there, Luke 2, verse 46. It's very interesting. Luke 2, verse 46. And it came to pass that after three days they found him in the temple, sitting in the midst of the doctors, and listen to this, both hearing them and asking them questions. So he's not just telling them, I'm the son of God, I'm going to die for the sins of God. He's hearing them and asking them questions. And all that heard him were astonished at his understanding and answers. Let's have a look at verse 52. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and man. So why do you think he had favour with man? Because he esteemed others better than himself. He was mindful of what other people were going through, what they were talking about. He listened to people and therefore he had great favour with people. So if you want to have favour with others, well, don't be so mindful of yourself, but esteem others better than yourself. So that's my first point about Jesus, that he esteemed others better than himself. And the second point there, if you can turn to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah chapter 53. Now, the second point about Jesus is that Jesus had great empathy for people. He had great empathy for people. And it's quite amazing, uh, this, this aspect of Jesus' personality. And he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Have a look there at verse 3 of Isaiah 53. It says there, He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid as it were our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, 
smitten of God and afflicted. So this is, of course, applying to talking about when Jesus died on the cross. But as well as that, there's a secondary application that Jesus is, this is how Jesus lived his everyday life. He would, he would take on and bear the sorrows and the griefs of others. It says that he was a man of sorrows. It doesn't mean he walked around being depressed and down in the dumps. But at the same time, he was also the most joyful man to ever walk the earth. So when it says that he was a man of sorrows, what I believe that's saying is that he took on the sorrows of others in empathy in relating to people. He was this extremely empathetic man. I'll give you an example of that in, in, in just a moment. So if you can turn to John chapter 11. John chapter 11. And, and Jesus wasn't afraid to be touched by the emotions of others. He was the sort of man that would feel your pain. If you were happy and you, were, you met Jesus, he would, he would feel your joy. And if you were going through something terrible and you're suffering, he would feel that suffering with you. And then be able to relate to you and give you the word of God and help you. Hebrews 4 verse 14, let me read that to you. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. And have a look at verse 15. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted as we are, yet without sin. So Jesus was touched by people's infirmities in his everyday life. He was touched by what people were going through. And John chapter 11, can you turn to verse 30? Let me give you a, a perfect example of Jesus showing empathy to people. John 11 verse 30. And this is the story of Lazarus when he's, he's passed away. Now Jesus was not yet coming to the town, but was in that place where Martha met him. Uh, Liddy, can you grab me a glass of water? The Jews then, which were with her in the house, and comforted her, when they saw Mary, that she arose up hastily and went out, followed her, saying, She goeth up upon up up she goeth unto the grave to weep there. Then when Mary was come where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother had not died. Thank you. When Jesus therefore listen to this, when Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping, which came with her, he groaned in the spirit and was troubled. So he's actually saw their weeping and saw them being distraught and upset and it affected him. He was troubled. Okay, and that's Jesus, the man. That's the man Christ Jesus. That's Jesus being a normal human being. And this is him starting to, to carry their sorrows. Verse 34, even though he knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead, he's still a normal human being and showed empathy and felt their pain. In verse 34, and, G and said, Where have you laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. You know, they're there crying and they're upset and Jesus is impacted. He's touched by their sorrows and their griefs and he, he weeps with them. That's what it means to show empathy. He's not feeling sorry for them. He's not being sympathetic towards them. He's having empathy, he's taking on, on how, how they feel. Verse 36, then said the Jews, behold, how he loved him. So they could see that Jesus loved Lazarus by how he was impacted by the other people that were there. He could see that, that he loved Lazarus. Verse 37, and some of them said, could not this man which opened the eyes of the blind have caused that even this man should not have died? Jesus therefore again groaning in himself cometh to the grave it was a cave and a stone lay upon it. So we can see there that Jesus was greatly impacted by how the people were feeling. And we, need not, we should not be afraid to be impacted by our brothers and sisters in, in the Lord about how they're feeling. If they're joyful, we'll be joyful with them. If they're weeping, we'll weep with them. And that's what true empathy is. And Jesus has given us an example. Have a, I'll just read this one to you. If you can turn to Luke chapter 19. Luke chapter 19, I'll read to you from verse, uh, John 13, verse 34. It says there, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this, all, by, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if ye have loved one to another. So Jesus is saying, you've seen me love you guys, now you need to love one another like I've loved you. Okay. And so that's what we're talking about today. We need to try and be like Jesus and show empathy 
and, and love to people by not being afraid to be touched by them. But if you're not going to esteem others better than yourself, if you're not going to put aside the things you're thinking about, the things which you're going through to then receive what other people are going through, then you can't do this. Okay, so we need to be able to show empathy and not be afraid, you know, to feel what other people are feeling so that we can give them the word of God. But at the same time, we don't want to be manipulated by people who are being insincere. Okay, so Jesus had that wisdom. That was another aspect of his life. He was really discerning of other people. He could pick out false, fake people. And we need to be discerning as well. Not every person who comes along, you know, making you know, being a mess and being upset is sincere, okay? We need to have that discernment. And the way you do that is by by being filled with the Holy Spirit, by loving the Word of God, not being filled with your own things, being filled with the Spirit, you're going to have great discernment. And that's what Jesus is like. So as well as taking on people's sorrows and griefs, Jesus is also a man of great joy. So you're there in Luke chapter 19. Have a verse, verse, have a look, sorry, at verse 1. It says there, And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, and behold, there was a, a man named Zacchaeus, which was, a, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. But he ran before and climbed up a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. You know, even this guy, was, even though he was little, on a side note, like he, didn't, he still found a way to find Jesus, even though he was little. He still found a way. Like, if someone wants to find the truth, well, they can find a way. There's no excuse for not finding a way. And this little guy, Zacchaeus, he found a way to meet Jesus. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. So he's full of joy. He's joyful about Jesus noticing him and saying, today I'm going to be in your house. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he is going to be a guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. So it doesn't say there that Jesus was joyful, but I believe that he took upon Zacchaeus' joy. And he was joyful when he was saying, Today a son of Abraham is in this house. I believe Jesus would have taken upon his joy. Let me read to you John 15, verse 11. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. So if you want to have fullness of joy, well, take on Jesus' joy, because he had more joy than anybody else. If he, if he didn't have more joy than everybody else, and he was down in the dumps, you'd, you'd be like, well, I don't want to take your joy, Jesus, because you're always depressed. No, they could see he was full of joy, so he could say that, and that your joy might be full if you receive my joy, because he was the most joyful person ever lived, ever lived and walked the face of the earth, I believe. Hebrews 1, hey, let me read that one to you. But unto the Son, he saith, Thy throne, O God, is for ever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Thou hast loved righteousness and hated inequity. Therefore God, even thy God, have anointed thee with the oil of gladness above thy fellows. So gladness is very similar to, to joy. And he had more joy than all his fellows. Okay, Because he loved righteousness and hated inequity. That's going to give you great joy and gladness in your life if you can learn to love the things God loves and hate sin. Like if you need more joy in your life, start to hate sin more and love righteousness more. And of course, that was what Jesus was like. He was a sinless man, therefore he had maximum joy, if I can put it like that. So the first point was Jesus was a man that esteemed others greater than himself. The second point was that he had great empathy with people and also Jesus as a person was joyful so if you were to bump into Jesus he wouldn't have been down in the dumps he would have been joyful he would have been a happy happy upbeat positive person and the fourth point I want to make is that Jesus had great discernment when it came to people and again I believe this is because Jesus had the Holy Spirit without measure therefore he was just super discerning of other people he could read people very well you could say you could say it like that and and because we have the spirit like only to a measure, like we're not going to be at the level of Jesus' discernment. 
But the greater you are filled with the Holy Spirit, the more discerning, the more like Jesus you'll be. And it's going to help you in life. It's going to help you in life. The closer we walk with the Lord, the more we're going to be like him in this way. And Jesus, because he wasn't a self-focused, a self-obsessed person, and he was mindful of others, he could then exercise this great discernment. So if you're the sort of person that's more mindful of your own things, it's going to be harder for you to be discerning when it comes to others. And also, the better uh, you are at discernment, the better soul winning you're going to be. And we're going to look at a, a great example of that now. If you can turn to John chapter 4. John chapter 4, which was what uh, Brother Sam read to us this morning. And while you're turning there, let me read to you uh, some quick examples of Jesus showing discernment. John 1, 47. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and saith of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. So Jesus saw Nathanael coming and he could discern this guy saved. And sometimes it's hard to tell if, if Jesus knew certain things because he's God, or sometimes did he know those things just because as a, as a normal man being discerning through the Holy Spirit. But, but anyway, he could discern that Nathanael was an Israelite indeed, and there was no guile in that man. Have you ever met somebody and you thought, this man's legit, this, or this woman or this person is a sincere Christian, and you just get that feeling, and you think maybe there's no guile in that person. Maybe, maybe I just get the feeling this person is a, a quality person I can be friends with. Sometimes you meet people and you're like, mm, I'm not so sure about this person, and that's you having discernment. Okay? And the closer you walk with the Lord, the more you are filled with the Holy Spirit, the better you're going to be at discerning people. And Mark 2, verse 5. When Jesus saw their faith, he said unto the sick of the palsy, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. But there were certain of the scribes sitting there and reasoning in their hearts, Why doth this man lust speak blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? And verse 8, have a, have a listen to this. And immediately when Jesus perceived in his spirit that they so reasoned within themselves, he said unto them, Why reason ye these things? In your heart. So it says there that in his spirit he could perceive they were thinking these things. John 16, verse 12. I have yet many things to say unto you, but you cannot bear them now. So he could discern that these people, they can't hear any more of the word of God right now. He could perceive that. And that's such a, a key we need to have when we go soul winning. Sometimes we have all this information and we want to just give them everything at once in one meeting. But we need to be discerning what they, what they can receive and what they can't receive. Okay, so we need to be, just be mindful of that. And John 4, if you can turn to verse 7, and let's look at an example of how Jesus used his discerning to bring about a great revival. John 4, John 4 verse 7. There cometh a woman of Samaria, Samaria to draw water, and Jesus saith unto her, Give me a drink. Is it only me, or do you guys think that was a bit of a, an abrupt sort of, Thing to say to this woman, give me a drink. Because that's something I've often thought about. Maybe it's just me, but do you guys think about that as well? I mean, that's a bit abrupt. Like, if someone said that to me, give me a drink or, or buy me a cup of coffee, I'd be like, well, wait a minute, why don't you buy yourself a cup of coffee, you know? But Jesus says to this woman, give me a drink. And I believe the reason he's done this is because he's perceived what sort of person she is. He can discern what sort of person she is. As we go and look through this story, we're going to see that she's an abrupt person herself. She's a, 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 an outspoken person, so Jesus can perceive that about her and then he speaks to her in the way that she can relate to, in a, in a sort of confrontational, abrupt sort of way. So he says to her, um, where are we there? Give me a drink, for his disciples were gone away into the city to buy meat. Then saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, askest drink of me? Which am, a, which am a woman of Samaria, for the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. So she doesn't get offended. She just said, well, how can you ask me for a drink? You know, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan, you shouldn't do this. And notice also here that Jesus didn't get sidetracked by this question. And that's a good soul winning tip. Like when we go soul winning and people ask us silly questions and try to go down the, the wrong, uh, a different tangent, like just don't worry about it. Just say, well, we can get back to that later. But Jesus ignored this question and stayed focused. Verse 10, Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. 
So Jesus could discern that this woman was someone worth trying to give the gospel to. Even though she was a bit prickly around the edges, he could see through that, that she could receive what, his, what he was saying. And the woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Are thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself and his children and his cattle? So you can see there she's not afraid to be a bit confrontational. But she's saying to this man, saying, who do you think you are? Are you greater than Jacob? And Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, <clears throat> but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. And the woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come here to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go, call thy husband, and come here. And it's interesting that he would say that because I think he's making the point that if he sees like a woman, he's saying, well, you should have a husband. And like young girls, when you, you should have a husband when you get older. So Jesus is making a point to this woman, well, go call your husband and come here. And the woman answered and said, I have no husband. See, here, she's been honest and she's been authentic. And Jesus appreciates that. Like she, he, he, she wasn't trying to hide the fact that she was a sinner and she had some issues. She was just being upfront and sincere with Jesus. So Jesus didn't have a problem with that. We're going to see later that Jesus had a, has a problem with people being um, insincere and fake. <clears throat> Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou hast now hast is not thy husband, in that, saidest, in that sayest thou truly. The woman saith unto him, Sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. That's a pretty bold thing to say. Just think, think about this for a moment. At this time, there hadn't been a prophet, except for John the Baptist, there hadn't been a prophet for hundreds of years since Malachi, maybe a few hundred years. And she's bold enough to say, ah, oh, you're a prophet. And for, dec for centuries, there'd been no prophets. Yes, she was bold enough to say, ah, oh, you're a prophet. So she's starting to catch on that this man is something special, not just an, every, an everyday man. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ, when he is come, he will tell us all things. Now, I love this next verse. It's probably one of my favourite verses in the Bible. And Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Like, he doesn't often say that to people. Like, he doesn't, he's not one to put his pearls before swine. And he tells this woman, like, I'm he. I'm the one you're waiting for. And that's, that's amazing. I think that's incredible that he would say that to this woman, like, I am he. Because you see, like, when he's, Talking with many other people, like he, he wouldn't say that to people. But with this woman, he did. He could discern that she could receive it. And, and, then, and then she goes away and she tells her, her family and people in the town that she's met the Christ. So she takes her, her bold personality and puts it to good use by preaching the gospel. Okay? And the personality that you have, God's given you that personality to preach the gospel. You may be a quieter person like me and you can use that side of your personality to, to be a gentle, loving soul in it. Or you can be like this woman and be pretty loud and bold and you can put that to good use, filled with the Holy Spirit. And let's have a look at the result of Jesus' discernment when dealing with this person. So Luke, uh, John, sorry, John 4, 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman, which testified, he told me all that I ever did. So we can see there that Jesus could relate to this person well and be mindful of what she, what she was like and be discerning and then give her the gospel in a way that's relevant to her and then she receives it and then we get this uh, mighty revival in, this, in her town. Okay, So this, that's why we need to be like Jesus and be personable like Jesus and be good with people like Jesus. Now have a look at Matthew 19 and let's compare this woman at the well to the rich young ruler. So Matthew 19, have a look there. Matthew 19 verse 16. <clears throat> and behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? And he said unto him, Why callest thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. So we can see there Jesus making himself of no reputation. He didn't say, Yes, I am God. Yes, I am a good master. But he didn't hold, that, he didn't hold on to that reputation. 
And but Jesus could discern that this man was full of pride, okay? And he saith unto him, which Jesus said, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, honour thy father and thy mother, and thou shalt love thy neighbour as thyself. The young man saith unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up. What yet? What lack I yet? So he's lying. He's not like the woman at the well and said, Oh, look, I've got no husband, I've had five husbands. This man was like, I've kept all the law. What's wrong? How come I don't know I've got eternal life? So you see the contrast there. And Jesus, and just on that, just, just be aware that you're going to come across people like that. You're going to come across people that are going to talk a big talk. They're going to say, oh, I'm this, I've done that, I've got 500 people saved last week and you know, I've done this and I've gone to this and done that and I know this person. You just need to be discerning because it, it might not be legit. Okay, Like this man, he was talking the talk. He was saying, I'm all this and something else and Jesus could see straight through him. And verse 21, Jesus said unto him, If thou will be perfect, go and sell all sell that thou hast and give to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. And when the young man heard that saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. So Jesus could see, oh, this man's not legit. So he didn't say to him, I who speak to you am the Christ, did he? He didn't say that to that man because he could discern, well, this guy can't receive that right now. He's so full of pride. I need to just give him a bit of a rebuke and maybe later he'll humble himself and get saved. Have a look at Luke 23, verse 8, if you can turn there, please. And let's have a look at how Jesus could discern the true motives of people. Turn to Luke chapter 23, verse 8. It says there, And when Herod saw Jesus, he was exceeding glad, for he was desirous to see him of a long season, because he had heard many things of him, and he hoped to see some miracle done by him. And then he questioned with him, then he questioned with him in many words, but he answered nothing. So Jesus totally gave this guy the cold shoulder. Herod just totally ignored him, had nothing to do with him. Even though he was excited and zealous and to see Jesus, like Herod just didn't, uh, Jesus didn't answer Herod one word because he knew what was in this man's heart. He could discern this guy is just a wolf. This guy is just a terrible person, a snake. And again, he, and he could also discern Judas. Have a look there. Uh, if you just turn to Luke chapter 20, I'll read to you John 6, 64. But there are some of you that believe not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. So Jesus could see and, and understand the hearts of people. He could discern that Judas wasn't legit. Have a look at Luke 20, verse 20. And they watched him and sent forth spies, which should feign themselves just men, that they might take hold of his words, so that so they might deliver him unto the power and authority of the governor. And they asked him, saying, Master, we know that thou sayest and teachest rightly, neither acceptest thou the person of any, but teachest the way of God truly. Is it lawful for us to give tribute unto Caesar or no? But he perceived their craftiness, and said unto them, Why tempt ye me? See, you couldn't put one past Jesus because he was so filled with the Holy Spirit and so full of discernment that he could just pick these guys out like they had like spotlights on them, okay? Because he was so full of the Holy Spirit. And the more you are filled with the Holy Spirit, the more you're going to be discerning when people are trying to deceive you. When people creep into this church, we're going to be able to pick them out hopefully fairly easily if we're discerning. Because the closer you are walking with the Lord and you know what the truth is, you know the truth uh, through the Holy Spirit, and if someone else comes along with a different spirit but pretending, using feigned words, you can sort of perceive that you know, something's not right with this person because they're not like us. Okay, And Jesus could perceive, well, these guys, they're not like my disciples, they're not like me. So he could say, yeah, you guys, uh, why are you trying to, perceive me, to deceive me with your craftiness? So let's recap so far. The first point, that Jesus esteemed others better than himself. He had great empathy. Uh, he was a joyful man and he had great discernment of, of people. And the fifth point, I've got six all up, so we're, we're getting towards the end. And the fifth point is that Jesus was the type of person that would spend time alone. He had a lot of alone time. If you can turn to Matthew chapter 14. 
And Jesus would take the time to be alone and recharge his batteries. And let me read to you from Mark 1, 35. And in the morning, rising up a great while before day, he went out and departed into a solitary place and there prayed. So he would go and seek to be alone. Not so he can watch TV, not so he can play video games, but so he can pray. So he sought to be alone so he could recharge his batteries by praying to the Father. And let me read to you from, from John 7, uh, verse 53. And every man went unto his own house. This is after he's been preaching all day, doing miracles. Every man went unto his own house. Jesus went unto the Mount of Olives. And early in the morning he came again into the temple and all the people came unto him and he sat down and taught them. So just have a look at what happened here. So the day ends, everyone goes to their own houses, but Jesus, for whatever reason, didn't have a house to go to, so he goes to the Mount of Olives. And he's all in, at the Mount of Olives all night by himself. And in the morning he comes down to the temple and teaches the people. So he spends all night just by himself um, at the Mount of Olives. So you're there Matthew 14 and verse 13. But we're going to pick up in the story just after Jesus has heard that John the Baptist has died, he's been beheaded. And this is Jesus' cousin and Jesus' friend, and he's just been beheaded. And when Jesus heard of it, this is Matthew 14, verse 13, when Jesus heard of it, he departed hence by a ship into a desert place apart. And when the people had heard thereof, they followed him on foot out of the city. So he's, he's heard that his, his best friend, well, not his best friend, but his cousins died and he's, and he's feeling this grief. So he goes away by himself just to probably you know, process what's happened. He's probably reminded him that you know, you're going to you know, die on the cross So because you know, that's why he came. So he, he goes by himself to spend some time alone after he's, he's suffered this loss. Okay, But it's interesting that people find him and they go to him and... Um, and, they, um, and he ministers to them. So he gets interrupted in his alone time, right? And, um, and Jesus went forth and saw a great multitude and was moved with compassion towards them and he healed their sick. And then he goes on and does the great miracle of feeding the 5,000, okay? And let's just jump down to verse 21. And they, had, and they that had eaten were about 5,000 men besides women and children. And straight, straightway, Jesus constrained his disciples to get into a ship and to go before him unto the other side while he sent the multitudes away. So he, he gets his disciples and you guys just get in the ship and go. He constrains them. So he compels them to go and to leave him alone, I, I guess. And they leave. And then he gets all the disciples that were the 5,000 and he sends them away, okay, to go before him. Uh, uh, verse 23 and when he had sent the multitudes away he went up into a mountain apart to pray and when the evening was come he was there alone so he gets interrupted in his alone time and he and he blesses the people preaches to the people feeds the five thousand and he sends them all the way again so he can pick up where he left off okay so he still wants to have his alone time okay and what he's doing is he's praying to the father so when you have if jesus needed to have his alone time to recharge, so, so do you. You need to have that time alone. But like I said before, not just to be worldly, not just to be get in the flesh, but to be spiritual, but to, to read your Bible and maybe contemplate on, on the Word of God, meditate on things and just process what's going on in your life with the Lord and pray. Okay, We need to do that. Jesus is given us that example that it's a priority to him. Like Even though he got interrupted, he didn't go, well, I guess I'll pray tomorrow morning. Like He picked up where he left off, and we should be like that as well. And uh, this leads to my last point. Another place where Jesus was alone was in the Garden of Gethsemane. Gethsemane. And my sixth point is this. Even though Jesus didn't have people sort of minister to him, like he didn't have people being empathetic towards him much at all, he was always the one just giving and ministering to others. So even though no one would turn the favour, he, it didn't stop him from continuing to be the person that he was, to be a giver and being there for people, even though they didn't return the favour. So that's my sixth point. don't know how you put that into words, but that's my sixth point. Have a look at Matthew chapter 26 and verse 36. Matthew 26, verse 36.
And this is a very um, intimate look into Jesus' life as a man. It says there, Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and saith unto the disciples, Sit ye here while I go and pray yonder. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zedebee and began to be sorrowful and very heavy. So he, he tells his disciples, stay here because he's going to go over yonder and pray. But then he picks his three best men because he knows he's, he's going through some terrible suffering here and he wants some people to share in his pain to help him, to be there for him. So he picks the three best men that he thinks that would be capable. This is what I assume, what I believe. He picks the three best men that may be able to be with him at this intimate emotional time. So I guess the question I would ask you guys and ask myself is, would he have picked you to be one of those people? Would he have picked me to be one of those people that could possibly bear, bear with him and show empathy to Jesus? I think this is quite an, an incredible story here. And he picks Peter, um, James and John. And verse 38. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceedingly sorrowful even unto death. Tarry ye here and watch with me. So he wants his three closest disciples just to be with him and share in his pain and help him. Okay, And, he's, and, and um, look at what happened. And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. And he cometh unto the disciples and findeth them asleep and saith unto Peter, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? I think that's pretty sad. Like he spent 33 years bearing the sorrows and the griefs of others and he says to Peter, Look, for one hour, for one hour, couldn't you watch with me? Couldn't you just be with me for one hour? I spent 33 years on this earth ministering to people and he said, What? Could you not watch with me one hour? Can you just, I, I really, that's really moving, I think. I think it's really sad. So what about you? Are you the type of person that can, can watch with somebody? Can you share in their pain? Or are you so filled with your own things that you can't be mindful of the things of others? That's a question for me as well. Verse 41. Watch and pray. So this is him still ministering to them, even though they haven't been there for him. He's still ministering to them. Watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. So he's still teaching them. He's still helping them, even though they're just not, not there for him in his moment of need. And if you, some people are more empathetic than others. And if you are an empathetic person, this is just going to be your life. You know, you're going to be receiving the, the pain and feeling the pain and suffering of others and spending time with them to, to help them, to minister to them. But you're probably not going to get that back. And Jesus was like that. So if that's you, it's just your lot in life. You can just fellowship with the Lord and he knows, okay? He can just give you the power and the energy through the Holy Spirit to keep on doing that, just like he was. So he, he knows what you're going through, okay? But that's my excuse just to say, look, I'm just not empathetic, so I don't care about what you're going through. You, you need to be. You need to be like Jesus, okay? If you want to be a good ambassador of Christ, you need to be like him in these, in these sort of ways. And verse 42, he went away again the second time and prayed, saying, O oh, my father, if this cup may not pass away from me, except I drink it, thy will be done. And he came and found him asleep again, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them and went away again and prayed the third time, saying the same words. Then cometh he to his disciples and saith unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. So you might say, well, if I was there, if I was in the garden, I wouldn't have been like Peter, James or John. I would have been there. I would have shed in his pain. I would have stood beside him. I would have prayed with him. I would have strengthened him. Maybe you can say that. Well, guess what? You still can do that in a sense. You still can do that to Jesus. Let me read to you, and I'll close here. Matthew 25, verse 40. And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you have done it unto me. So if you want to minister to Jesus, if you want to be there in a sense in his moment of, of need, we'll do it to one another. You'll do it to your brothers and sisters in the church. And, and Jesus would take that as if you did it unto him. Okay? Right, let's pray.